Welcome to Let's Face the Facts, the rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. Join us each week as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show. And now, here's your host of Let's Face the Facts, the wonderful David Almeida! Welcome back. It's another week, another show. Thank you for downloading and pressing play. This is David, and I'm already connected and speaking to Matthew on the Zoom call. Hi, Matthew. Hi, David. We have a great episode this week to talk about. We do? Did we, we watch the same episode? Did Did you not? <laughs> I, oh. I guess oh. because I didn't hate it, I wasn't, I wasn't too horribly mad at it. Yeah, the but, word great didn't come into my notes at all, but <laughs> all right. How about, it's it's great that we still continue to meet together and talk about this this TV show. We have an episode to talk about. There, there it is. Okay. I, I cannot disagree with that statement, Your Honor. Oof. Before we start, we've got some housekeeping again. More housekeeping this week, Matthew, but it's, uh, it's kind of a, a fun thing. First off, we need to welcome a new Tutti Frutti, Matthew. Ooh. Another Tutti Frutti, Mendel H. Mendel, we are so happy to have you. I believe you've already been actively commenting in social media. Your name is not unfamiliar to me. So we are thrilled that you are now part of the Patreon at the $3 a month level, which gets you the entire back catalog of TV Talkaholics, exclusive extras every single week directly to your podcatcher, and... We're really thrilled. This is your official shout out, Mendel H. And we wish to welcome you to the family. And then remember last week we did a little viewer mail, Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> not not really a, a thing. I, viewer mail would imply we have many people writing into us. Uh, but the, the other thing was a, it was a Facebook comment that I had to share last week. And another one has happened. And I could not let this one go by. Eileen M., commented on Facebook. Remember last week we were talking about what would the spinoff show be with Joe and Blair getting married and having their respective husbands, Rick and Casey, and them living over the help center. And that's our new show when we were trying to find the title yeah. for it. And we, we never really found it. Eileen M writes, dudes, I just finished this app season nine, episode 12 and was screaming the backdoor pilot name for the two married couples show, The Facts of Wife. Come on! The come on was actually in the comment. Oh, okay. So Eileen is making sure we know that we really missed that. We, we totally did drop the ball there. I can't believe we didn't think of that. That is, that is a good one. <laughs> Eileen goes on to comment, Oh, and I love you both so much. I must to still be listening at season nine. Yikes. But yes, the new guy is a tasty treat, referring, I assume, to Scott Bryce as Rick Bonner. So uh, thank you, Eileen. Thank you for calling us out for missing the, the obvious one that was right there in front of our face. That's what the show would have been called. And yes, I would have watched that spinoff. Yeah. But now let's talk about season nine, episode 13, Something in Common which had an original air date of January 16th, 1988. The nuts and bolts are the episode was written by Michael Porius, P-O-R-Y-E-S. This is the fifth and final episode he would write for the series. We've talked about him at length before. And the notable thing about his career is after this, he would go on to co-create both That's So Raven and Hannah Montana meaning he is a, a very rich man nowadays. Yeah. And the episode was directed by John Boab. Old faithful, old reliable. There it is. So you ready to give us a synopsis, Matthew? Yeah, I'm, I'm for it. I will tell you, I had to watch the Daily Motion version because I can't find the remote for my DVD player. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Do you think Judy took it and like, Hit it or it's probably it. kicked under a couch or something. But um, oh. so unless I missed anything in this episode, um, the TV guide synopsis is um, Pippa needs a place to sleep. 
100% correct. That is the synopsis of the episode. And I guess some other stuff happens too, but... Yeah, other stuff. Like, you know, Joe is now officially dating Rick from last week. And again, 80s sitcom, last week they met, and now they're already to the point where they're giving gifts as a couple. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was very, very interesting. Yeah. But the great thing about this episode is we get more Rick. We get the wonderful Scott Bryce reprising his role as Rick Bonner, soon to be Joe's fiance and husband. We don't know that yet. Soon to be Joe Bonner. <laughs> Joe Bonner. Joe Boner is a name I used to dance under. Mm -hmm. But that was a, that was a long time ago. That was, yeah. you know, back in the early 2000s. Um. And we also, of course, get Alex Rocco as Joe's dad. And of course, it's a little bit of a TV trope plot where Joe's dating a guy and it seems like it's getting serious, but her dad doesn't like him. Oh, what's going to happen? Oh, they're fighting over the boy she likes. That's uh, uh, well, OK. Yeah, I did write down like uh, this trope of the first meeting and the boyfriend's weird. Ah, uh, because oh, yeah. he's meeting him in a dress, but I just like ugh, okay. But yeah. I thought the way they handled it was pretty pretty good, actually. I, I agree. The, the conversation that they had was was pretty good. Yeah, but, there really weren't many. I'm trying to think if there were any come on moments here. Just uh, when Pippa opened her mouth and oh yeah, modi odi. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and it, that and that line did not get a laugh. None of the lines that none of the Australianisms nope. that that she used got a laugh. Not one of them. Mm. So, so, in your punchable Pippa moments, the audience would have heard you making contact with her face uh, and your fist. You're her moldy oldie. Get the fuck out. He's fifty-two. Suck a bag of dicks, Pippa. Yeah. We already hate that you are now officially, as of this episode, a regular on the series. And she is now posed around the piano with all the others in that final shot of the opening credits. And there she will remain through the end of the series. That is definitely upsetting. And <laughs> we, we already have said we don't like it. Oh, I guess there is another TV synopsis I could have given you. What? Where's Tootie? Where's to <laughs> you who tootie? What, yep. The fuck, you just take a week off? Yeah, it's so weird. They did mention that she's out of town just in passing Ugh, for this to happen with Tootie out of town. Uh, yeah. So um, we do have the other punchable Pippa moment is the, the when she says goodbye to Alex Rocco. She says, according to the subtitles on the dvd she says uru o o r o o and he says uru back and then turns to joe and says i don't know what i just said which actually did get a little bit of a laugh thank you alex rocco but it's actually i did look it up and google it the term is huru h o o r o o which is just an australian way of saying goodbye like cheerio pip pip Go fuck yourself. Suck a bag of dicks. Yes, Beverly Ann. How to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I need a couple more examples. Alex Rocco, this is his penultimate episode. This is uh, the last time we see him before Joe's wedding. And Joe's wedding will be the final time he and Claire Malice appear as her mother. And uh, always great when he's around. And I think their scene at the end is just... It's magnificent. It really is. He's they so are good. so good together. They really are. And I love, love that Nancy McKeon understood that and made sure to keep getting him to play her father in future series. I just love that as a, as a historical footnote, as it were. We begin with a jogging joke of Beverly Ann running into the house as though she's been jogging. Remember when jogging was the big craze in the 70s and the 80s? And I have, have never and will never understand running for fun. I just, 
<laughs> I I know I'm not an athletic person, but I just have never understood running for fun. I think it is about the endorphin rush. I have I have done little jogging and running in my life. I'm more of a, a walker or a biker, a slow biker, but I'm with you there. It's just, you know, you need to elevate your heart rate. That you do need to do. And running a marathon, running 26 miles to achieve that, it's a little bit of overkill, runners, really. Come on. You could be sitting home watching the facts of life. I can think of several ways to raise my heart rate that <laughs> do not include running. Yeah. Yes. Watching the news. Oh. That'll do it. That's true. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, they're running and we get the, the old joke that the old lady is real good at it. I thought I was watching an episode of Life with Lucy for a second. <laughs> The way Beverly Ann came running in and continuing to run around the the living room. Um, and Natalie, like she's a like she's like a lung, like she's on an iron lung walking yeah. in. And and we've done this joke before. Remember back in the episode called Running back in season one, so eight years ago, which is freaky. We already did that joke where Mrs. Garrett comes running in. And then the girls follow and Tootie is holding up Natalie, who's dying. And anyway, yeah. it's like we've kind of done this joke before. The only real payoff we get is that when Beverly Ann goes to move the sheets off the couch, uh, she doesn't realize Pippa's still in them sleeping. So she throws her on the floor and then Andy comes in and Andy is panting terribly. And as Pippa walks by him, she says, oh, come on, Andy, you've seen a girl in a nightgown. Cut it out. That 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 was a because see here's the thing this is the the mind fuck I'm having because Sherry Kren is so good and likable mm -hmm. and appropriate but I just hate the character so much <laughs> like every scene she has like the reaction she has when Beverly Ann pulls her off the couch is brilliant. The mm -hmm. This line, just in passing, as she says it to Andy, is great. The whole girl talk, girl talk, yeah, girl talk, that yeah. was great. I just don't know what it is. There's just too many girls. You're not one of my girls. I don't know. But she's, yeah. again, this episode proves that she's, she's great at what she's doing. She was given an impossible task. True. Yeah. So, so true. Um, so, and that has, and that leads to nothing. The only thing you might say is this might relate to this cake situation, which is coming down the pike. We'll, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it, but the jogging is that there is nothing to it. It doesn't really relate to anything else in the episode. Now, beginning the actual plot, the A story is Joe is going to a party with Rick and she is asking Blair to cover for her because she has this party. And of course, Joe's dad is coming to town the next day because it's his birthday. And so can you cover my shift at the store at over our heads? And Blair is like, uh, no, in case you didn't notice, I'm in law school now and I'm busy and uh, and they do say, oh, they'll all the times for Tootie to be out of town trying to cover. And uh, they ask Beverly Ann and Beverly Ann is like, no, no, I cover for you way too much. And they're like, well, what else do you have going on? And she's kind of like, OK, so maybe I don't have a life, but I'll, OK, fine. Yeah, wow. Over our heads is suddenly very important out of the blue, isn't it? They are very worried about covering their shifts at over our heads this, this week. Uh, yeah. Didn't worry about going out to Richard Mall's house for a full week. No. Nope. Uh, how many times have we said, who is minding the store? How many times? And yet now suddenly it matters. And. Uh, There's going to be a last time that we say it, David. And I know. we won't know it's. We won't know it's the last time we've said it. We might have already had the last time we said who's minding the store. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Considering Tootie is not in this episode, and we we actually have buried the lead here. What we're leading up to is, we should have said at the beginning of all this, 
This is the episode, the dreaded episode, where they say, let's close the store. Mm. So as of this episode, after this going forward, there is no more over our heads. Meaning, we have already seen Tootie in the store for the last time. And we didn't know. Is this the last time we see it? Yeah. Isn't it? I don't know. They, I, I'm pretty sure. Oh, God. Now you have me questioning myself, and I never do I that. I can't remember every episode from epi- from season nine, so I don't know if they pop back in again, like next week or the week after. Or, so I don't know. No, I'm pretty sure they don't. I guess I have to add a little addendum. This is the last time we see over our heads, unless I'm wrong and we do see it in the future. But I'm pretty sure we do not. That once they get this off their plate to worry about, and maybe someone in the writer's room was saying, um, who's minding this door? Will you shut up? Fine, we're going to close the store. And this little dickwad quit asking us. 19-year-old David Almeida, shut your fucking annoying pie hole. <sighs> David, there's so many layers to this episode. Joe has to dress like a man. What? <laughs> what? And thank God they at least had the sense of humor and the foresight to make a joke of it when she's saying to Blair, look, I need you to cover this shift because we're going to a gender swap party and I have to figure out what I'm going to wear. Rick is going to wear women's clothes and I'm going to wear men's clothes. And Blair, Lisa Welcho, perfectly just does an up and down, looking at her outfit like... And that's different how? (laughs) And then she comes down in a women's men's suit. Like that was that was clearly cut for a woman. Yeah. Like put her in a men's jacket, Diana. Yeah, that is so weird. Everything else she has worn has been so boxy and all that. It's it is very weird that this was a better tailored outfit than most of the other stuff we've seen her wear. Not because it is designed badly, because that's what the style was. So yeah, that was a a big, a bit of a question mark, but uh, yeah. Anyway, this store issue, we haven't gotten yet to closing the store. Just Beverly Ann is saying she'll cover, but it's the last time. Uh, Then we have the next scene where they're, getting ready for the party. Rick has shown up and it goes up into the other room. Does Rick go up into Beverly Ann's room to change? He goes up to that first landing, doesn't he? Um, I think so. I'm pretty sure he does. So there's that. And then Charlie shows up apparently a day early. Joe had earlier said she needed to arrange for a hotel for him. When she leaves and is like, oh, dad, hey, you're here a day early. Well, we're going off to a party. Hey. And out they go. They, they just leave them there. And part of me is like, no one in conversation is like, so w- where were you thinking that you're going to be staying tonight when you show up a day early to? <sighs> well, the fact that it's such an ordeal, I have to find a hotel room for him. How am I, how am I going to find a hotel room in peak skill? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, every, every, so everybody's It's going to be a 10-minute phone call I'm going to have to make to uh, probably the only hotel in town. That I could probably make while I was working in the shop. Yeah, thank you. Because it's not like you have any fucking customers last we saw. Other point of interest, I, I this is a curiosity. When we were talking about Scott Bryce last week, I mentioned that he was on another podcast where he talked at length about this and many other things. Uh, The host of that did ask him about the dress when Rick comes flouncing down the stairs in this almost looks like a figure skaters type of an outfit with the flowy things. He says that that costume was actually a costume made for Carol Burnett. Uh, Oh, Cal Burnett is a very slender woman. Cal Burnett was tiny. So the idea that any outfit on him would also have been something built for her, I'm not so sure. But what I will say is it is sequined and flowing. I would bet money. Diana got this 
from the warehouse where all the other Mackie stuff is that she frequently borrowed for the show because she had access to it. So I don't doubt for one second that this is a Bob Mackie. I do doubt that it was built for Cal Burnett because when you're borrowing stuff, you can't do too much to it. She would have had to put some panels in there and it looked like it was fitting him. Not that Scott Bryce is not a slender man, but he 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 look like a man. Let's let's be real. I don't yeah. believe he could wear a Carol Burnett article of clothing. But anyway, I'm like I said, I would bet money that that is a Bob Mackie. And that's, uh, you know, Diana would have gotten it from her from her warehouse there. Rick comes down the stairs and he is singing. He's singing an actual song. Do you notice? Wasn't it? I feel pretty. I feel pretty from West Side Story. Music by Leonard Bernstein, lyrics by Stephen Sondheim. Thank you. Well, now we know why last week they sang for He's a Jolly Good Fellow for Rick's birthday. And we know why the week before in Golden Oldies, we were listening to Be It Ever So Humble, There's No Place Like Home. We just had two weeks where there were public domain songs for which they did not have to pay a single dime. And clearly this is why they were saving their pennies so they could afford to have him flounce down the stairs going, I feel pretty. Oh, so pretty. And he stops just short of, I feel pretty and witty. And the next word would be what Matthew, right? Well, in the movie, because they said it a little bit earlier in the day, she sings, I'm pretty and witty and gay. And I pity uh, any girl who isn't me today uh, versus bright, which rhymes with tonight. Because I feel pretty happens later in the narrative, in the stage version. They move it to earlier in the evening. Uh, so that's why they had to change it from night to day. But yeah, pretty witty and doesn't say gay. We stop at that. But that's what we're all thinking because... It's a dude in a dress, so clearly he's a little, he's a little, but Joe explains the situation with the party and why they are all dressed, why they are both dressed opposite gender, blah, blah, blah. But in the course of getting to know each other in introductions, uh, she says Rick plays piano, and we find out something we've never known before is that Charlie used to play the saxophone, and uh, this is something that normally would drive me crazy, but for to be honest, this is not something that ever would have come up before. And according to Charlie, he gave it up a long time ago. So I was not as mad at this as you might think I would be. I wasn't as mad at that as I was that we're all forgetting Joe plays the piano. <laughs> exactly. We completely, that has not come up at all. That That is something Joe and Rick have in common. I actually had forgotten that myself till you just said it (laughs) truly Matthew so Joe and her dad never played together and again the narrative of Joe was that well her mother was a waitress so she hung out in the clubs well where was Charlie in this because uh the weird thing is Charlie says oh that lifestyle though you know just playing in smoky clubs and all that and so he says where do you play Rick and he says in smoky clubs Last week, we said that Rick was a concert pianist. Yeah. Oh, facts of life. Oh, well, show Bible. I think I, I took that as he is like last week. They He was like, oh, I, I quit my job as a concert pianist. So now I think he's doing like gigs in smoky rooms. Uh, working his way back up the ranks. Sure. I think he's just taking some gigs for some for some money. Yeah. So then we have that weird moment where they just like say, oh, you're here for a day early. Bye. There is a, a cut here. There's a cut scene, Matthew, that if you watch the Daily Motion version, you missed it. It's an over our head scene. So there's a whole other over our heads little thing. that uh-huh. cut. And uh, so one good thing is. When they go out the door, the scene goes to the the birthday party 
in the Daily Motion version. Yeah. In this, they leave and Charlie is left there. And he turns and I didn't realize Blair is sitting at the table, at the dining room table with the book or studying. So they didn't leave him alone. So he turns and he says, huh, can you believe that? Is that Rick guy good or whatever? And she says, I don't know. I don't think I can, I can sign off on it. Leaving the house in that dress without a bra. Ha <laughs> ha! Something to that effect, but. Then the over our head scene has Natalie at the counter behind the register, answering the phone saying, over our heads, the store that has everything. Oh, no, we don't have that. Oh, sorry, we're a lot of those. No, we don't have those either. No, we're not going to rethink our catchphrase. Goodbye. Click. Was that ever their catchphrase? No, but it does beg the question. If you're all out of this stuff, because no one was minding the star. Well, as we will learn in the following scene. So this is planting the seeds. It, technically, if it's if the, the comedy rule of threes, the three bits that create this B story is number one. First scene, them trying to cover the shifts and Beverly Ann saying this is happening a lot more lately. And then this is the number two. And then number three is the upcoming scene where they really are finding that they're out of stuff. But uh, yeah, Joe and her dad come in. They say hi to Natalie. Rick can't join them for a birthday lunch because he's playing at the Hudson Grill. Never heard of this Hudson Grill place before. Beverly Ann asks Charlie what kind of cake he wants because she doesn't want to do the simple and traditional chocolate. I thought I would offer you some interesting alternatives. Mango, kiwi, or kumquat. And they all look at each other in unison. They say, chocolate. Once again, listeners, you are welcome for my spot on Cloris Leachman as Beverly Ann impression. And yes, I'm aware it sounds an awful lot like um, me. <laughs> Natalie is like, oh, by the way, I have to write a paper. Beverly Ann, can you cover my shift? I want Beverly Ann to say, bitch, you know I'm going to bake a cake. You just heard me negotiating. What the fuck? But anyway, Beverly Ann does agree to stay there a little bit. The phone rings and she answers and says, hello, over our heads. Our store hours? <sighs> I'm always here. But um, end of it. That's like a two minute scene that is cut. For syndication. All the other cuts are little itty bitty nips and tucks that really aren't uh, consequential. Then we go to the birthday party. What a big to do. So many people there now that we have Pippa, now that we have Rick, even without Tootie there. Um, it is Charlie's 52nd birthday. The big deal of, oh, he's well beyond half a century. How old do you think Alex Rocco actually is in this scene? Oh, God, it's probably some like 38. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably 35 what is he? <laughs> this is gonna hurt my feelings isn't it <laughs> he actually is 52 they're not lying oh, for once thank god an actor is playing their actual age i, I that's a rough 52 i think i think he, i would if they had said 60 i would have been like mm -hmm, yeah it's an 88 52 unlike the 2022 54 that you see on your zoom screen before you exactly without a line or a, or a sag or anything because yeah. I turned that filter on to take those away. My filter is Navajo blanket. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get another Beverly Annism. They cut into the cake and she says, well, this cake that I baked is 100% natural. No flour, no butter, and no chocolate. I can't believe she didn't say sugar. Even in the 80s, we knew sugar was the enemy. I can't believe she didn't say there was no sugar in it. She didn't? Weird... No, she said no flour, no butter, no chocolate. So they're like, well, then what is in the cake? Barley water, carob, and tofu. See, I'm fucking out. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry. You. Come on. Really? I'm sorry. I've, I've got a friend who's a baker. And like, she's trying new things and I get it. Try new things. She made sweet potato. She made chocolate frosting with sweet potatoes. I could see that. It wasn't terrible, but it's not fucking chocolate. 
No, I agree. I just, I'm sorry. I just, it's like all these, like I did that whole 30 diet and it's like, well, you can use to sweeten things up medjool dates. Oh yeah. I'll just <laughs> run out and grab some medjool dates. At it's any like, medjool date store. I just, it's all these ridiculous things like, mm -hmm. like substitutes for stuff that I'm like, what the, what? Ugh, just give me a piece of cake. I agree. I am so there. It's a birthday. You're splurging. Why? If you're going to bake a cake, make that. Uh, thing. But yeah, we know friend of the podcast, Laura Hodas is a, a big baker. We talk baking a lot when she was on the show and she is mostly keto these days. And so she's constantly posting pictures on her Instagram of, of these keto desserts that she bakes and they, they look and I've had them. She's brought them into work and I've, I've enjoyed them. They're, they're lovely. They ain't butter and sugar and flour and, <laughs> all the good stuff, but they're fine. They're fine. But when you think of it, this kind of was like, you know, health food stuff kind of started to gain traction in the seventies, but in the eighties with the let's get physical, the diet industry, the exercise industry, the thigh master, and that the, the GNC stores, this is kind of when it was really hitting when, when, you know, ice cream, suddenly you were seeing more frozen yogurt no. Like it's better for you in some weird way. So this, I, I look at this as being very of its time, but it's also a come on moment because Beverly Ann's already supposed to be a terrible cook and a bad baker. So why would you then say, well, let's have her be a bad baker with awful ingredients nobody wants to eat for a party, not as an experiment of, oh, I thought I'd try to make this, see what you think of it, is it any good? But for a showpiece yeah. Barley water, carob, and tofu. Just no. No. The fuck out of here with that, Beverly Ann. <laughs> <laughs> then Joe and Rick give Charlie their gift from him, and it's a saxophone. It's and from us. Yeah. You're wondering, is it a little bit like, Joe, it's from Joe, it's from me, but I'll say it's from us. That way it'll kind of, you know, get you in good with the old man. But she says he found it at a secondhand store. So was, he found it. Oh, she did. You're right. Huh. Well, anyhow, Charlie is like, you shouldn't have done this. And they're like, oh, no, it's nothing. We thought you'd be like, no, you shouldn't have done this. Jesus Christ, dude. I don't play anymore. Why would you waste your money on something I can't use? Well, excuse the fuck out of me. Who does that? Again, sitcom trope, I think. But sitcoms. Like, like Blair, when she comes down to the Alice in Wonderland party that says, they thought she what wanted. What the fuck are you all doing here? Yeah, this is not what I want, you stupid cunts. It's like, Blair? One always has the choice to be gracious. One always has the choice. You say thank you. Exactly. They gave you a saxophone, dude. Yeah. And they could have kind of soft pedaled this a little in the writing. This is a rewrite that I will send back in the time machine. Uh, it could be a, well, get, take it out, dad, play it. And be like, no, I, I don't want to. And it's like, wow, we want to hear you. Yay, Charlie, come on. And have him say, guys, really, I don't want to. I don't play anymore and i'd appreciate it if we just dropped it let's get on with the rest of the party kind of a thing where he can be a little pointedly avoidant but not a fucking dick about it good lord charlie he's so rick leaves and and again now continuing the sitcom trope rick leaves visually and obviously a little bit offended by this and then joe and rick kiss kiss goodbye they're smooching and uh yeah. So In then, front of your dad. Uh, why not? Mm. Like they, 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 I don't think they use tongue. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. So then after he's gone, Joe is like, what in the actual fuck? And Charlie's last words to her before we dramatically go to commercial is, you want me to have a happy birthday? Find another guy to go out with. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and what's going on here is, and writing wise, this is so difficult. And I think they're mostly successful. 
all of Rick's dialogue is light and goofy and making jokes and making light of stuff. We're continuing that thing of Rick being kind of the, the loose cannon goofball. And, and Scott Bryce is playing it wonderfully. And it, it isn't as bad or forced as it well could have been. Yeah. So that didn't bother me. They, they almost could have done a tiny little bit more where Charlie could say point me. Maybe he does at some point say point blank. This guy's a goofball. He's a clown. He's not serious about anything. Why would you think he's serious about you? I, I don't think I would have hated that, but, but uh, as it is truly, it's fine. It really is. So when we come back from commercial, we're up in the bedroom now. The uh, question is, why is Pippa asleep in Joe's bed? And Blair says, because I wouldn't let her sleep in mine. And it's because there's people downstairs and she didn't want it because Pippa's still on the couch. Joe does ask Blair, what does she think about Rick? Well, and what the fuck time is it? That fucking Pippa's the only one asleep. <laughs> it's, it is weird. Uh, Joe does say, why didn't she check? We've been, the, the living room's been empty for an hour. Rick, why left. didn't she check? Because she's been asleep yeah. in your bed. <laughs> it's That's true. why. <laughs> You're right. And You're I was totally like, right. Why is everyone awake? But Pip is the only one that's in bed. I didn't yeah. know what time it was. Maybe it's late at night. I don't know. But Well, Joe said she went out for a walk. So, And they're still in their same party costume. So they all did the party. Rick left. Joe and Charlie had the fight. And then Joe went out for a walk. So it is the evening hour. And Blair is studying. So is Natalie. You know, they're, they are playing up Natalie's back in school, back in class, learning writing stuff so those little elements are here and again that's those are good things i have to credit the writers which i'm uh not frequently able to do because i fixate on the other shit so but in response to joe asking blair what do you think of rick because it's literally joe saying dad doesn't like rick am i not seeing something and blair's response is you're a social worker he's a nutcase it's perfect and then Pippa wakes up while Natalie comes out of their little interior bedroom, which again, I forget. Have we seen the inside of that bedroom? I know they show it on, I think they show it twice. And I know one of the times is in the first time. I think we have seen it only once before. Jesus, how many sets do they have on this stage? Thank you. That's why we got to get rid of this over our heads. It's cramping our style. And it probably takes for fucking ever to set up and break down. And, and as Diana said, they joked, it's like they have the same merchandise on the shelves that they've had for two years. They haven't technically sold anything if you go by visuals. But then we have the bit of Pippa waking up and being sad that she's missing all the girl talk. And they're just like, well, go, go away. No one wants you here. I don't know. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But anyway, end of the scene. It's just Joe is questioning Rick because they've been seeing each other for a whole week. They got to figure out how fucking serious they're going to be, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's been. I, want, I'm, I just feel like Joe didn't really get the support she deserved from her friends. Like, like come on, Blair. She's obviously got a real thing going on here. Give her, give her something. Give her a little Blair. Give her, give her some of Blair's superpower, where Blair can suddenly be very honest and direct with Joe. Mm -hmm. I wanted that a little bit. Not yeah. the you're a social worker. He's a nutcase. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. Yeah. Aha. But I'm serious here. My dad doesn't like the guy that I'm in love with. Yeah. And we've seen my dad five times in the past eight years. So he's clearly a very big part of my life. I don't know. I'm right now looking at the script. I don't think at any point Joe tells them that the dad doesn't like him. Yeah, I'm looking. I just look back at the, the transcript of the scene. One reason I think that she doesn't get the support is she doesn't technically tell them dad doesn't like rick she's saying i'm just trying to get an objective opinion i'm just wondering and there's the whole thing of well why are you suddenly taking interest in what other people think and what we think about you and rick and all that and the joke is pippa interrupting going what is this girl talk and the scene ends with them going in the morning pippa like go fuck yourself and quit bothering us yeah but she technically doesn't 
tell them, and she should. Huh. Very curious. Curiouser and curiouser. But that's Joe. You know, she doesn't like asking for help. She's a tough nut to crack and doesn't need other people. Hey. God forbid we give these characters some layers. Yeah. Or vulnerability. Yeah. But, you know, why would Joe be vulnerable around Blair, you know? Uh, so then the next scene is, according to the Daily Motion version, now, finally, this is when you, Matthew, and the people watching that version, finally, for the first time in season nine, get to lay eyes on over our heads. Oh, it was like seeing Edna's edibles again. It was it like was an just, old friend. It was like a comfortable old shoe. It was. I do want to pause and mention that we do have a Tutti Frutti, Peter B., who had written to us. He's the one that uh, previously mentioned about Tutti being too loud, and it's because of her yes. having the tube in her ear. Uh, he also wrote down on Patreon, made a comment that he believed that this was a mock set, that this wasn't the full over our headset, that we had already seen the last of it, and this was just a sort of makeshift half-assed version version makeshift half-assed version to give us the visual without having to go the whole way and peter i'm i'm going to have to disagree with you on this this looked to me like the full-fledged top to bottom over our headset do you have any thoughts on that matthew i went in knowing that and was particularly noticing things mm -hmm. and uh, I'm gonna have to go back and see the last time we actually did see over our heads and do a side-by-side -side comparison I'm gonna have to because I can see where he's coming from but at the same time I'm like fuck all those all those candy displays in the front, like was some of the set still there? Like, did they still have the, the counter, you know, and they just had to build the stuff around it. But, but, uh, cause I can kind of see where he's coming from. Cause it did look. Eh. Well, it did look different because they were playing up the fact. It did look janky. It definitely looked less populated. I think they deliberately made it look like the shelves were emptier and those candy bins in the front, Again, we've never seen them ever sell one fucking jujube yeah. in all the years they've had the store. But they made those candy dispensers half full. Some of them were just empty. Like it was definitely a deliberate choice to say the store needs to look neglected and sparse. But when you consider Joe and her dad in the earlier scene come in from the front door, Beverly Ann comes in from the kitchen to ask about the cake. And then when they're like, oh, we're all out of Vanna White placemats, Joe then appears from the storeroom behind the, the cookie counter where Edna used to keep her baked goods. Joe comes in from that quote unquote storeroom saying, oh, I found the Vanna White placemats, all 3,000 of them, meaning they fucked up and overordered while yeah. other things, they were out of stock. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking it does look different, but specifically and deliberately so and more important than anything peter this is my opinion and i have nothing to back it up diana didn't have any uh, input uh, that she could recall as far as this goes but uh, i am not saying you are wrong i am not saying i am right i am just saying this is my opinion and you sound like you're on the fence i am on the fence mm-hmm Okay. Well, Peter, if you want to do side by side, you know, I love screen grabs. If you want to take me down, then absolutely send us some screen grabs. If you want to, if you, if you think you can, you can pop this bubble that I want to believe. And I need to believe that this is really the over our heads that we've fallen in love with and are never going to see again. <laughs> so moving on. Yeah. So with all of the things that are out of stock, all the stuff we've already mentioned, and well, who was supposed to order it, and Natalie and Blair pointing at each other. Finally, Beverly Ann, with ledger book in hand, drops the bomb that we did not ever see coming. 
when she says the words, girls, the store isn't showing a profit. <gasps> what? <laughs> Homo says what? <laughs> I haven't seen it in 13 weeks. Have not mentioned it, spoken of it. They, they've walked in and out of it. That's all we know. It was, it was a door they went through. But the bomb is the store isn't showing a profit. Now, thankfully, the girls don't have a reaction like I just had. They don't turn to her and go, wait, what? What do you? They're just kind of like, mm, yeah. So Beverly Ann puts forth that with their school, with their relationships, with their careers, maybe it doesn't make sense to have the store anymore particularly with Pippa sleeping in the living room and Andy living in the basement next to the boiler. How many times have they said in the basement next to the boiler? That's multiple times they have pointed yeah. that out to us. At yeah. least that's a show Bible consistent thing. The, the, the boiler is canon. That is true. So they're all like, what, so what? She's like, we could convert the store to bedrooms for Andy and Pippa. A, a storefront with a display window, a commercial. Th how, would you... You're going to have to. Yeah, you're going to have to just tear that part of the house off and completely build something. I, I don't know how they were going to do that. And also, I'm like, so now this house has five bedrooms. Let's not forget Raymond, who oh. owns the building. When he has to sell this place, he's like, here's a house with five bedrooms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and two and one other room. Uh, yeah. And, and a storefront that's not a store anymore. Five bedrooms, right? Pippa, Andy, Beverly Ann, the girls. And the inside ne girls. Ne and the inside girls. So five fucking bedrooms in that house. The <sighs> It's I agree with you. And my thing is that you can any property can be reconfigured to be anything else. You can put apartments in a you know factory loft and all that. That's been done since the beginning of time. But the fact that this is clearly a, a storefront. Here's a dumb thing. This has got to be a standalone building. But it also is on Main Street, or that's right, High Adna Zedibles on High Street. So this has to be in somewhat of a commercial area. We know they're across the street from the hardware uh, store, the, the hardware store. And there's also a bakery. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, we're like, so why is that this edibles across from a bakery? And the couple of exterior shots we've seen, it's been a porch looking thing. Like it's almost like a strip of shops that are yeah. connected. Uh, this is, you know, I know it's not like the show to be nonspecific about details like this. But it's it is very odd. I think in places like Bangor, Maine, mm -hmm. there are parts of the town that have shops like this that are in the front of someone's house. Yeah. And that is in the commercial area. Yeah. Well, you know like on I mean? New Smyrna Beach, you know, there's Flagler Avenue. There were little cute little shops and restaurants. Some of them are new buildings. Some of them are strips. Some of them are just little houses where there's a shop in the front and someone probably lives upstairs. So I still feel like the exteriors that we have seen have been misleading. Oh, completely. 100%. So, but at this point, we, we still have to say, okay, fine. So we have this house. It's a standalone house. It is clearly in some type of a retail area where there's foot traffic. There's people who walk by the front and now you're just going to what take out the glass windows and board them up. It is so bizarre to me. So weird. Not to mention, not that this has been a concern of anybody's up till now, but what was the financial situation? I thought this was all their job. I thought this was what was justifying them living here in this house. They're, they're paying rent to Raymond to live and have a store there. The idea was, at the very least, you assume the store was offsetting the basic living expenses. Uh, the, turning a profit, David. Yeah, it's not. I don't know. Man, guys, I, 
I, I've been through the books three times. <laughs> and I, I cannot find where we've sold anything in the last 13 weeks. Man, just, it's upsetting. So we we can mourn this. They do smartly say, well, we need to talk to Tootie and we need to talk to Mrs. Garrett. So Edna is planning to make a phone call. And um, then in a later scene, Pippa and Andy are planning out how they want the whole thing laid out. Jokes being, I want a fireplace here and a beam ceiling and a hot tub over there. Of course, Andy wants a hot tub. So we can have Hugh Hefner over and the Playboy bunnies and he can be you know, doing coke off of their tits and stuff. But um, horny little Andy. He's 14. He's 14. The horniest 14-year-old on television. <laughs> on television, but not the horniest 14-year-old in existence. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, yeah, when I was 14, I wanted the hot tub and the Playboy bunnies and the coke. Who didn't? So then Rick shows up and they are supposed to go to a seminar. He and Joe have a fight because Joe is suddenly being bitchy toward him. Unfounded. It's just Joe because she's having doubts. And she's in a bad mood. and doesn't know where her mind is. And we get a cringe line out of Rick. Uh, hopefully it's the last one. Are you are you know what I'm where I'm headed with this? No. <sighs> she's basically says. You want to just go and spend your money. We're supposed to go to the seminar. And you know, I needed to go to this because it's for my work. And if you didn't want to go, I wish you'd have told me because I would have just gone on my own. And he was like, whoa, whoa. And then she gets into, you're just always all about fun and never buckling down. And he says, so is this you talking or is this word for word what your dad said to you? And of course, that doesn't go well. And she's like, it's not my dad, but a bada boom. And his response to this is, look, this is me and I like me. And up until this weekend, you liked me too. But something's changed around here and it ain't the Rickster. And out he goes. <sighs> the Rickster. I didn't know that's where you were going. and But I do have written down in all caps, the Rickster. Really? Wow. <laughs> that is grounds for breaking up right then and there. She should yeah. have said, and he will never set foot through that door ever again. Yeah. For referring to himself in the third person as the Rickster. Yeah. <laughs> Even in 1988. No. Nope. Deal breaker. We're done. Yeah. It's over. Dad, you were so right. We're over. Come on over. Let's have some good birthday cake. End of episode. <laughs> and I think no matter who you're friends with, if they all gathered around and said, so what happened? Did you just decide you couldn't deal with the piano playing? And she'd be like, no, he referred to himself as the Rickster. There would have been the whole room would have been like, uh, OK, oh, mm, yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. You had no. to, girl. You yeah. had to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Understood. No more explanation. Deeply, deeply upsetting. So uh, then knock at the door. A white flag is waved inside the door. That gets a laugh. And Joe says, come on in, Rick. And it's not Rick. It's Charlie. Charlie has brought her flowers and is somewhat apologizing. It sounds like he's like, I'm sorry we fought, but he still feels the same way. And back to the sitcom trope, but somehow Alex Rocco and Nancy McKeon elevate this material and make it better and believable, where he says, Rick reminds me of me when I was younger and I was convinced I was going to make it and I didn't. And I don't want to see you end up with somebody in a situation where basically he's setting himself up to fail and then he won't be able to be a supportive partner to you, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing a lot of uh, enhancing here. But it's the thing of, I don't want you by extension of him making the wrong choices that I made, which is what every parent does. So at the end, the thing that sort of breaks the tension is he says, look at me, I'm 52 years old and what do I have to show for my life? And Nancy McKeon kind of drops her head and he realizes what he's just said. 
And then he says, okay, wow. Come to think of it, I didn't do too bad, did I? So then there are I love yous now that this sort of bearing of the soul has happened. Rick comes back in a suit and tie saying he's going to get a real job and a corporate thing because apparently it's worth it to him. This does actually speak well of Rick. But thankfully, in response to Rick saying, am I a nice young man now or what? Charlie says, take off that ridiculous tie. And then he takes the saxophone and he fake plays the saxophone as Rick goes over to the piano and fake plays the piano and they jam and the credits roll. Yeah. Everything is okay now. And he is magnificent. Oh, concert ready. Hasn't touched the instrument in 30 years. (laughs) Hasn't touched it in 30 years. (laughs) But I did like the way Alex Rocco treated the saxophone. How he licked the reed. I noticed that too. He wet the mouthpiece. And I thought I thought for a second he was actually going to play it and, mm-hmm. and, and be good. But um, that didn't that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, the faking was not terrible. And uh, smartly, they didn't they didn't linger on that shot too long. We got a very quick cutaway to Nancy McKeon enjoying yeah. their performance and then a wide shot where we can't really see. Well, we are at the end, the not the end of an episode, Matthew. We're at the end of an era, the end of over our heads. Yeah. Thank God we got some good Alex Rocco, Nancy McKeon scene work out of them. Thank God we still like Rick in spite of the Rickster. I don't know who else could have pulled off that and had us not hate him infinitely after that. But I was not mad at this episode overall. It's just sad because of uh, what it brings. It brought Joe and Rick closer together, but it brought us the end of Over Our Heads. (laughs) And I would watch a show where Charlie has bought a jazz club and he needs Joe and her husband, Rick, to help run it. And Rick plays the piano. The father and the son-in-law have nothing in common, but everything in common. Because the one thing they have in common is their love for Joe. And she's a cocktail waitress. So it's like she's she's frustrated because she's become her mother. And Matthew, oh uh, shit, this is brilliant. I would watch a show called Charlie's Place, starring the wonderful Alex Rocco and Joe Polnicek. <laughs> Charlie's Place, that is amazing. This, yes. And on the menu would be Beverly Ann's Barley water carob tofu cake. No. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> that is brilliant, though. I'm with you. I would totally watch that. T- a, a sitcom, a weekly sitcom where you got Alex Rocco and Nancy McKeon. Fuck to the yes. Bring it. I want to go to there. And the Rickster. Charlie and the Rickster. That's that's a little bit more of a catchy title, isn't it? Yeah. So that brings us to the end of season nine, episode 13. Next week, we're going to be bringing you another TV Talkaholics release. It's the episode where we discuss The Worst Witch, the 1988 TV movie that Charlotte Ray did right after she left The Facts of Life. That is available on YouTube, and I will post a link to that in the show notes and on this episode's webpage. And then, after that, the following week, we will return to Season 9 of The Facts of Life and discuss Season 9, Episode 14, called Peak Skill Law, which will be the return of Blair's law professor with whom she did not have an affair, but his wife accused her nonetheless. That is all for this week. Thank you so much for listening to this week's show. And remember, the facts of life are all about the Rickster. Let's Face the Facts was created, produced, written, hosted, and edited by the wonderful David Almeida. Our theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Please visit facethefactspod.com for supplemental photos and videos, links to social media, and ways that you can support the show. 
And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This is Matthew Arder saying tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.